a bit too early. It's also even a bit naive to um, to expect dramatic uh, change and, and substantive progress with democratization at such an early stage. But we obviously have to recognize that the Euromaidan has been a really uh, important and unprecedented event um, in the Ukrainian history and even in the history of the whole post-Soviet space overall. Um, the, uh, the length and the scale of the mobilization was uh, quite unprecedented. Um, it's also very important that the protests have spread at some point uh, beyond the, uh, the country's capital into the regions and um, the protests in the regions have been uh, quite sustained and, and the mobilization continues. People uh, now in the post-revolutionary phase have left the square but have not demobilized. Uh, the civil society is very active, a lot of new initiatives um, are being started. Um, so um, I think this is where we have to look for when uh, we think in terms of the potential for democratization, the fact that the civil society has become more autonomous, more diverse, and there is uh, much, a, a much more proactive attitude towards pushing for systemic reforms um, of the state and um, really trying to work towards uh, ensuring greater political impact uh, by different civic actors. And so this is one of the uh, key um, elements, I think, for future democratization in Ukraine. Um, the European Union has made quite some progress recently in terms of rethinking uh, its civil society support and putting uh, emphasis on uh, the engagement of civil society in the policy process. This is, of course, important for Ukraine now. It has earmarked substantial funding specifically uh, for civil society support and for engaging civil society um, in uh, its programs. Um, the other important element, I think, is that um, a greater role is now envisioned for the EU delegation in Kyiv in terms of uh, planning and, and disbursing this funding. So this might, you know, one hopes that this might actually lead to more custom-made um, disbursement of funds and, and more interaction with the actual recipients in terms of uh, what's the best use uh, for that money, for the greater political impact. I think there are a few areas where um, the EU can um, do more or let's say experiment more, uh, uh, work more on uh, updating its approach. One is, as I mentioned, is uh, the regions. Um, that really seems to be the new frontier in terms of reform in Ukraine. Um, the questions of empowering local communities, improving local governance, the decentralization process. Um, these are all questions that are uh, crucial for reforming the Ukrainian state. They go beyond the question of um, the military conflict uh, in two of the regions, in the region of Lugansk and Donetsk at the moment. Um, and so I think there's a lot that uh, the EU can do in terms of uh, boosting the uh, local civic activism, the community um, initiatives, local media initiatives, um, and in, with its uh, civil society aid, but also or with other instruments that is using like the development aid. The other um, element, I think, is that uh, the EU is now a very important uh, funder uh, for uh, the government in Ukraine um, in times of crisis. Um, this hasn't, shouldn't be um, a lost opportunity, um, given the amounts of aid that is being delivered, um, to actually uh, exercise more leverage on, um, on Ukrainian government in terms of improving the governance structures that are um, necessary for disbursing and making the best use of these funds um, uh, so you know um, so that the funds are actually spent in a more transparent more efficient manner so there is more coordination between both the international actors and the domestic actors but also between different domestic actors involved um, in uh, using this uh, this money more oversight from the civil society over how the money is used so that the um, the final outcome is, is not uh, only um, saving the Ukrainian state from the collapse, but also um, the improved, uh, uh, more efficient and more accountable uh, governance process behind that.